how did a teddy bear become the enemy? How do you make a watermark? And how can part of a moving car remain perfectly still? Some lolly. Earn some lolly. It's one of your money-making scams. Yes, I it? bet it is, isn't it? To Not get some money from us in quite. some way. No, I'm talking about lollipops. Ah. Real lollies. Yes. It's a good how. This. It's a good how. Um, if you win this bet, you get a lolly each, right? There's one yeah. here for it. If I win, I get to keep the lollies. Okay. Which two lollies? are furthest apart. What a ridiculously simple how. The two lollies furthest apart are the red and the yellow, obviously because the gap between them is greater than the gap between yellow and brown there. So these two, yellow no, and red, no, are no, furthest no, apart. No, 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 Fred, no. Obvious. You're wrong. You see, this is a trick question yeah. because it depends how you define lollipop, and I bet the lollipop is, it doesn't include the stick, so that means that the two furthest apart are the brown one and the yellow one. Oh. Carol, you say brown and yellow. yellow. Fred, you say red and yellow. Yes. You're both wrong. It's the red and the brown one that are furthest apart. No. And that's how I earn some lolly, that's how. Now, how can you make a watermark in a £20 note? Now, you can see as you put the note up to light that the uh, pattern here has various shading, which gives you the watermark itself. How's it done? I can tell you how to do that. You simply get your paper, soak it thoroughly, get your stamp, and there's your watermark. Rather oversimplified, Freddie, might I say. <laughs> the secret is is that you make the mark as you make the paper itself. Now, ordinary paper is made from wood pulp, which obviously comes from trees, but banknotes are made from cotton fibres mixed up with water, as they are here. Now, what about the mark? Well, obviously, you have to decide, first of all, on the pattern that you want. Now, here we have a wire mesh with the pattern of Prince Charles and Princess Diana. But the secret of this is that there are lots of indentations, lots of lumpy bits here, which will give us different concentrations of cotton fibre. And if I hold it up to the light, you can see that it's like a very fine sieve. So if I put the frame on top of that, dip it into the uh, cotton fibre, put that over like that, just let quite a bit of the water drain out. And then, obviously, when this is done in a factory, they wouldn't take as much fibre as that. Put it onto some felt, which will take in a lot of the water, and put a lot of pressure on to squeeze the water out. Now, in the factory process, tonnes and tonnes of pressure would be applied to get the paper very thin. But uh, we'll see how well I've done with it. Take that off. Take the frame off. Oh, dear. And then just tip it out on some felt to dry. Just give it one final squeeze. And hopefully, we'll see the beginnings of the watermark. You can see here the indentations already of Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Fine process, I think. So, eventually, once that's dried off, you're left with something like this. A bit of a classic of the genre, really. <laughs> yes, I hope so, yes. <laughs> and uh, here you see, again, Prince Charles, Princess Diana, and the lumpy bits here, which are obviously where the concentrations and the heights of the cotton fibres vary. The final part of the process is to squash all of that so that where there is more cotton fibre, you get a much darker pattern. Once that's been done and done properly, you end up with a beautiful piece of paper and might I say, a beautiful watermark of the two of them together. And that is how you make a watermark in a banknote. How did a teddy bear become an enemy, and how, come to that, did we get teddy bears in the first place? Well, for the answer to that, we need to go back to the year 1902 and the United States of America. And at that time, the president of America was a gentleman called Theodore Roosevelt, otherwise known as Teddy. And he was called in to settle rather a boring border dispute between the states of Mississippi and Louisiana. 
talks dragged on and to try and break them up a little bit, they decided to go on a bear hunt. The trouble was they couldn't find any bears to shoot. So they tied a little baby bear to the foot of a tree and said to the president, Aww. you can shoot him. Aww. No. They did. But the president was a kindly sort of chap and he wasn't having any of that. And he Good. said, let the bear go. And they did. Well, his kind gesture caught the imagination of the public and the press and the cartoonists. And cartoons like this appeared. I won't shoot that cub. But at the same time, rather an enterprising toy manufacturer in New York thought about Teddy Roosevelt and about the bear and began producing these little toys called Teddy Bears. At the same time as well, in Germany, in Europe, a company called Steiff was also producing Teddy Bears. And here is a Steiff bear. A lot of these bears found their way into Britain which again was fine until the year 1914 when war broke out between Britain and Germany and suddenly it was very unpatriotic to have a German bear in your bed. I'm right, chaps, aren't I? In fact, postcards were produced urging people to ban German bears. Some of them are quite strong. This one here actually says, so perish all my enemies. No. And there's a little German bear being stabbed. But fortunately, British manufacturers were producing British teddy bears. And thank goodness they were, because because of that, the great British bears of all time, Rupert, Paddington, Winnie, Sooty, and all the others are with us still today. So that's how a teddy bear became an enemy. Aww. But that's how also the great British bear became our best friend. Hooray! And that's how. How can part of a moving car be standing still? That is a contradiction in terms. Come over here, Fred, and I'll prove to you that part of a moving car does in fact stand still. And you will be staggered, Fred, to find out that the part of the car that actually stands still is actually on the wheel. Now then, here's a wheel. If I spin this wheel for you, right, the whole wheel is moving. But if I introduce another element to this equation, the wheel moving forward as it spins, you will see that part of the wheel actually stands still relative to the ground. You've got to offer proof. Here is the proof. I've got a test track here for my wheel. If I put a red felt marker in the centre of my wheel and roll it along, it should leave a line on this piece of glass here. What kind of line do you think it leaves? It's Fred? in the centre. You'll get a fairly straight line across the glass. There you go. Quite right, Fred. Very it's pretty, but no line. sign of a stop. Quite right. No sign of a stop. But if I move my felt marker, from the centre of the wheel to halfway between the centre of the wheel and the rim. What kind of line will it draw this time? A slightly wavy line, I would think. There now look, are. that line is actually speeding up at the top and slowing down. Speeding up and slowing down, even though the wheel travels at constant speed forwards. Where's the stop? No stop yet. But if I move my pen to the outside rim of the wheel, I will show you where the stop is. Happens. This bit of the wheel will stop. Okay. Wheel moves forward at a constant speed. It goes down. Did you see that then? Did you see? Oops, missed that one. Trying again the bottom. There, look at that. That, you're saying, yeah. is the wheel stopping? Yeah. For as a split the, second. For a split second, the wheel stops as it speeds up at the top and slows down until it actually stops. Now, conclusive proof of this is with a wheel. Now, look, relative to the ground, the wheel is stood still. If I roll it to you, the point on the wheel stands still. For if that wheel was actually spinning relative to the ground, it would actually leave skid marks. Now, do you believe me? I do, yes. <laughs> Only just. I do. But if I told you that there is a case where a wheel, or part of a wheel, actually goes backwards as it's going forward, would you believe me? No. There is a case. This is it. With a train wheel. Train wheel. This bit sits on a rail. This bit round the edge is called the flange, and that keeps it on the rail. And it's the part of the flange, or a point on the flange, that actually goes backwards. Now then, here's a model of a train wheel. It runs on the inner wheel. If I trace a point on the flange on my glass here, look, did you see that there? Not only does it stop for a second, but before it stops, it changes direction. You can see that by that funny little loop uh, it leaves. And that happens, it's not an optical illusion. It's not an optical illusion, it's called cycloid movement. That's how a point on the wheel 
can actually stand still for a moment, or even in the case of a train wheel, go backwards. Very strange, but absolutely true. Did you believe it? In the end, he even convinced me. Did, yes, he? He did. Now, a completely different type of how. Right. How do the Chinese listen to the cricket? They put on the old tranny, they tune it to the World Service, and then... <sighs> no, that's not what I mean at all. I don't mean cricket the sport, I mean cricket the insect. Here we have a tank full of absolutely beautiful chirping crickets. Listen to that wonderful sound. Now the Chinese love to have that sound in the houses, so what they do, I take a few crickets and put them in these sort of uh, raffia type cages and hang them up around the house so that when they're inside the house they can listen to this lovely tranquil inner peace that transmits from the cricket. But how does the cricket make this sound? Well he does it by using his wings. You can see the wings on top of the uh, cricket's body there. And what he does is he rubs those wings together. Now on the bottom wing he has sort of ridges like this and on the top wing he has a sort of peg-like thing attached to a membrane here. And by rubbing these two together you can hear, well this is a very dull horrible cardboard type sound, but he makes that lovely noise. But if all he did was just rub those two together it wouldn't be a very loud noise. So he uses the membrane to amplify that sound. And if you consider, a drum does exactly the same thing. Imagine that this is the sound that you would hear without the membrane. Can't hear it. It's not very loud, is it? No. But if you put it on top of that, instant amplification, you can hear it. And the cavity underneath here, which is the drum, effectively, the cricket is able to alter this by altering where his wings are relative to his body. And by doing that, he can actually fool predators because the predators want to come along and eat the cricket. But by altering the size of this cavity, the cricket can fool them by pretending that he's in one place, then another, a little bit like a ventriloquist. And that is how the Chinese listen to the cricket. And actually, there's another little how here. How do crickets listen to each other? They hear each other through their knees. Pardon? Oh, dear. How do you spell fish? F-I-S-H. That is one way, the conventional way, but there is another. Come with me to the Dainage Academy of Spelling and I will show you how. You see, in the days before dictionaries, people spelled words according to how they thought they sounded. And taking that one stage further, whilst I grant you that that is the conventional way of spelling fish, I put it to you that this is how the word should be spelt. G-H-O-T-I. Let me explain. What is that word? It is rough. The F part of it is the G-H on the end. What is that word? Women. The I part of women is the O. And finally, what is that word? It is station. And the SH part of station is the T-I in the middle. So have you got it now? F I SH spells fish. Let's see if the lesson has been absorbed. Form 4Z, spelling lesson. Come on, sit down. Sit down. Sit. Borderman, what does that say? It says goatee, so it's fairly obvious it to anyone. It does not, not say goatee no, at all. No, sir, sir. Top. It's his faulty circus, G-H is fur in rough. Ha ha, you're stupid. Stupid no, lad. says what he like. Plow were the G H in plow. Wati. No, Top. no, sir. It says wash, sir, because T I is in wash. Stupid boy. Yes. It does not. It says fa i sha fish, and that's how, according to me, you spell fish, even if nobody else understands it. But that's how for now. You've got it now. now? What? Why are you, Why are you so, so old? old?